problems. Um, so it's a great pleasure to have uh, Tibor Damour with us. Uh, of course, uh, you know that uh, he's one of the recipients of the Dirac medal and uh, he's going to, uh, the ceremony will be tomorrow uh, afternoon. But today he's going to give uh, a lecture to our school and uh, the title is Analytical Approaches to Gravitational Wave Signals. Please. Thank you. Yes. Um, so you all know that uh, starting on, yes, on 14 of September 2015, the ground-based network of gravitational wave, interferometric gravitational wave detectors, which at the time, alas, Virgo was not uh, working, uh, so only the two LIGO interferometers, uh, detected the first gravitational wave signals. Now the network comprises two LIGO um, detectors, two interferometers in the States, Virgo, the French-Italian uh, detector here in Italy, near Pisa, and now the Japanese detector Kagra is working. Soon the LIGO India detector will work too. So we are talking about detecting gravitational waves from binary systems, which is up to now the only source which has been detected by this uh, network. And the point of these lectures will be to explain briefly uh, the analytical side, how analytical uh, computations, which have been done by many people over many years, starting uh, very long ago, you will see, uh, how these analytical approaches are important because they are the ones which allow to, um, to search and to analyze the parameters, like to compute, you know, what are the masses of the two objects that go around and then merge, what is the spin. Uh, so I will briefly explain these things. But first, let me tell you that um, there have been three observing sessions, uh, successful observing sessions by the LIGO-Virgo network of interferometers. Uh, and the number of events uh, now amounts to 90 events. And among these 90 events, most of them, 85, are those blue things. So those blue dots, the vertical axis are the masses. And any one of these, for instance, means here that you have two masses of, let's say, uh, 30, uh, it's like 20, it's the first event probably here. Like you have 29 solar masses here and 36 solar masses, which are the initial masses of the two objects, which merge. And at the end, these two black holes merge in one final black hole, which is indicated here as the bigger dot, which is now something uh, 60 solar masses. And so, most of, of these events you see are those blue things, two black holes merging in a, at the end in a bigger black hole, and there are 85 of them. And as you see, some of them give really large black holes, like this one has nearly 200 solar masses because the initial uh, things contain something bigger than 100 solar mass. Okay, and uh, so these are uh, 85 events. And uh, the other events are indicated with different colors. Like here, these two things are two small objects, two small masses objects, because the two initial bodies have a mass between one and two solar masses, like 1.4 solar masses. So when you have an object which merge and you don't see it has any extension and it has a mass of the order of 1.4, you say it's a neutron star. So here you have two neutron stars that merge, but then two neutron stars of 1.4, probably at the end you don't, you, are, you don't know for sure what they create, but probably uh, if the total mass is 2.8 or a little bit less, it has to be a black hole because we don't, but we don't know for sure. Okay, but probably these two things gave black holes. Then there are mixed objects. Three of them are probably neutron star and black holes. Like uh, this one is really a neutron star and this is like a nearly 10 solar mass, so you know it is a black hole, let's say. Uh, and there is one ambiguous uh, system 
where the secondary object has a mass, I forgot now, 2.6, 2.7 solar mass, and then you don't know for sure whether an object of 2.6 solar mass is a very heavy neutron star, the heaviest never seen, because now the heaviest neutron star is like 2, 2.1, something like that solar mass. One does not know the really the maximum mass of a neutron star, or if it is a really small mass black hole, okay. So um, anyway, these are the current uh, events. Now, why are analytical uh, calculations of gravitational waves um, useful? So a, a basic fact is, okay, we are talking about gravitational wave observed in an interferometer. An interferometer uh, measures the, the, the fractional difference in the variation of the arm length you, you send laser light here, and then you recombine the light, so it measures the difference of optical path between the two things. They, they go several times between the mirrors. I mean, it's a very delicate thing which took uh, many years to be developed. But at the end, what you really observe are this, which is the fractional change, delta L over L, of the arm length, the difference between the two arms, delta L over L. And as you can see, these are really what was observed during the 0 0.2 seconds of the first event on 14 September 2015. And you could say, naively, you see something which is like a wave here going up and down, so maybe it is the gravitational wave. But if you look at the vertical axis, this is delta L over L, it's dimensionless, you see it is of the order of 10 minus 18, okay? Why? In reality, the effect of the gravitational wave was 10 minus 21. The amplitude of the gravitational wave that I will define, H, which has a physical effect of making a fractional variation of the length of these three kilometer, four kilometer arms, delta L over L, equal 10 minus 21. So, uh, the ratio between the real effect here, which is contained here of the gravitational wave, and what you see is a part in a thousand, which means the gravitational wave signal is totally lost in what you see, and what you see is broadband noise. Uh, color noise, which means it is not white noise, you know, which is random all the time, but which is oscillating up and down because it's a, a low frequency noise. Okay, and it is because of this that if you want to see the gravitational wave signal, you have to extract it from the noise, and this is why knowing the precise shape of the gravitational wave signal lost in this thing is very important. So, actually, there are several methods for, I mean, there are several methods which are used together. Yes, question, uh, please. Is the broadband noise correlated between the two detections? A, a priori, uh, uh, no, uh, uh, it should not, and, and roughly you see that uh, it is not. I mean, both of them have low frequency uh, variations, like uh, the, the, the mirrors oscillate, so you have variation, you know, at 10 hertz, okay? And, and then you have this, but they should not be in phase, okay? Yes. To yes, to remove this thing. Yes, I did. I was seeing this, which does not appear on this screen. Okay. Okay. Yes, indeed, because it was. So what I was showing here is that the real gravitational wave signal is this. It has this precise shape, as we will discuss. But its amplitude is 1,000 times what you see here. Okay. So it's totally lost in this, which contains both, you know, low frequency noise and fast noise, because if you enter in this thing, you see also kilohertz noise, okay. Now, uh, there are several techniques which are used to extract uh, signal, like one technique, which by the way, uses a lot of uh, the, um, it's a time frequency transform where um, this representation here is uh, frequency uh, versus time. You, you look for something whose frequency varies with time. And the techniques that have been used have been introduced initially, apart from very old ideas, evidently coming from Gabor and <laughs> Fourier and all that, uh, by Ken Wilson, 
And then uh, the French mathematician Yves Meyer, and then Ingrid Daubechy, Joffa. So many people contributed to this. This is useful for a very fast diagnostic that maybe there is something, but it is not very accurate to find weak signals and also to measure the masses. Why? Uh, I will concentrate on the method called match filtering, which is just that if you have um, uh, something which is the sum of a random signal and a random, sorry, noise and a signal that you look for, one way to find if there is the signal you look for is to do a correlation. You do, in, after doing a Fourier transform, you do the scalar product of the output of the detector or of the expected signal, which is called template. So template means the waveform, this thing, that you expect to be present, except that this signal depends on the two masses and the two spins. So actually, this shape uh, depends uh, on several parameters, okay? Therefore, you need to compute in advance hundreds of thousands or millions of templates with varying masses, varying spins. You try all of them. You do this correlation, inverse weighted by the noise. Sn is the noise in the frequency domain. This is called Wiener filtering because this is the optimal way of knowing if the signal H of F is present in the output of your detectors, okay? So it's called match filtering. So what was done for the original, um, the, the first discovery and which is done today is one computes hundreds of thousands of templates. They are actually, these are called banks of templates and there are two types of banks of templates. One which is using the method for which Alessandra Buonanno and myself will receive the Dirac Medal uh, tomorrow. And this method uh, is an analytical method which has been then improved for the last part of the signal, as I will mention, by using numerical relativity results. And, and this is why Saul Tokolsky and Franz Pretorius share the Dirac Medal with us because it's the combination of the two things which gives a very accurate way of describing uh, those templates. And there are two different banks of templates, one which fully use our analytical uh, method and the other one which uses also our analytical method but in a different way and with more numerical relativity data. Uh, okay, this was just the motivation. Uh, analytical methods, and that's what I will describe, have been useful are now useful and will be useful in the future always to detect gravitational waves in, uh, in interferometers. Now, what is the problem? How do you compute uh, those templates, the gravitational waveform emitted by two black holes? So here you have a space-time diagram. Uh, it's not a DNA molecule. It is a space-time diagram where time goes up and space is uh, horizontal. So here it describes two horizons, two black holes going around in space-time. They go around for 100 millions of years. Initially, they are very far apart. Then uh, they get closer and closer. They emit gravitational waves, and the emission of gravitational waves, as we will describe, makes them go faster and at the end merge, and, and then this creates this signal at infinity. Mathematically, you want to solve Einstein's equations. So Einstein's equations, as you know, are these. We're in presence of matter. Matter is very important in cosmology, in a sense. But uh, for two black holes, there is no matter. There was matter when the black holes were created from a collapsing star. I will recall what is a black hole. But today, it's purely Einstein vacuum equation. And here, you have the explicit form. So these are the full Einstein's equation written in a certain coordinate system called harmonic. So let me remind you of the basics of what is the gravitational waves. Gravitational waves have been first uh, understood to be present in Einstein's theory by Einstein himself. Somebody is, I will, I will, I yes, is uh, in 1916 with, and then he corrected something in 1918. So, um, at the naive level, uh, you can see that there exists gravitational wave in Einstein's uh, theory by saying, 
I look for a solution of Einstein's equation, which is a small deviation from Minkowski space. Einstein's equation says that the Ricci tensor of the space-time metric is zero. Uh, Minkowski space is a particular solution called flat solution, flat space-time. If you make a small perturbation of flat space-time called h mu nu, first you can show that when you look for a solution of Einstein equation, you can go to a coordinate system where the only perturbations are in the special metric h i j, where the indices i j takes the three space dimension. So you look for solution of this type, the other components being zero, and then you find that the generic solution of Einstein equations can be written as the superposition of two different traveling waves. Those waves, they travel in some direction here taken to be the z direction with the velocity of light, c, and they are characterized by a polarization tensor, uh, which are uh, in the plane orthogonal to the, to the direction of propagation. So if the wave propagates in the z-axis, the gravitational wave has only components in xy, in the horizontal plane. And uh, as was first understood by people in the 50s, especially Joe Weber and also Pirani, the physical effect of a gravitational wave when it comes uh, on a ring of particle, let's say if you have on this, if you have a wave coming from the, in the z-axis, from the ceiling, if you have a ring of particles <laughs> at rest here on, on this table, the effect of the two polarization is to transform this circle in an ellipse during the first half period, then the ellipse, so it stretches one direction and squeezes the, let's say, x-axis, squeezes the y-axis, in the, and the reverse in the other period, or it does it not in the x, y axis, but at 45 degrees. So these are the two independent polarization. And numerically, the fractional change in the distance between the, the center and the particle here, delta L divided by the original distance L, is given by this formula. Uh, the one half comes from Einstein's equations. H, I, J is the amplitude here, the variation of the metric. And N is the direction uh, in which direction you, you are. N is a vector in this thing. And now Einstein also gave us the lowest approximation of how a gravitational wave is generated by moving matter. And he found that the amplitude of the gravitational wave, which is a dimensionless quantity, pure number, is given by this in lowest approximation by the second time derivative of the quadrupole uh, of the mass distributions. So the quadrupole is defined this way. Um, the mass density is defined as being the zero, zero component of T mu nu divided by C square. You know, E equal MC square, Einstein said. Energy is the mass C square. So mass is energy divided by T square. This is why you, you find that the quadrupole is, is defined by this. And um, so this formula says you must take the second derivative of the quadrupole moment, you project it orthogonally to the plane n, and then it propagates at the velocity of light in all directions, and it decays like 1 over r. So this gives the basic uh, description at lowest order of gravitational waves emitted by any mass distribution, like a binary system. When you have two masses moving around, the quadrupole changes in time, and then this creates a gravitational wave. Now, the first person to, for many years, and including, you know, when I, I learned myself general relativity as a kid, reading Landau Lifshitz edition uh, in uh, the edition of 1966, which I read uh, at some age. Uh, in this edition, after showing the formula of uh, Einstein, there was an explicit sentence saying, if you put numbers in this formula, you get such a small gravitational wave that it is totally negligible in all thinkable uh, condition, even on cosmic time scales. So at the time, people thought gravitational waves are so small that you cannot detect them, and they have no effect visible whatever. Actually, the first person who understood that this was not necessarily true was Dyson, Freeman Dyson, the famous Dyson who, you know, uh, mathematized the intuition of Feynman in uh, quantum field theory and put together Schwinger, Feynman, and Tomanaga, uh, Freeman. So he, he, he solved, this is an exercise in Landau-Lifshitz, 
Uh, and the exercise in Landau Lifshitz, is, which is the basic physics of what I'm talking about, this exercise is saying, let's take a binary system. This binary system at lowest order is uh, as an interaction between the two bodies given by Newton's one over R gravitational interaction. So the total energy E of the system, if it is on a circular orbit for simplicity, is the sum of the kinetic energy and the potential energy, which is negative. And the sum, uh, because of this, has minus, the, it's a negative binding energy, minus one half the inverse of the distance. And this energy, if this system emits gravitational waves, and in landau lifshitz you are asked to compute what is the flux, the instantaneous energy loss per second due to emitting gravitational waves at infinity by the formula I showed before, second time derivative of the quadrupole moment, etc. You find that, and then you expect that if the system is losing <laughs> eterni- energy at infinity, it should pay this energy by giving its binding energy, okay? So you write a balance equation, which is the time derivative of the energy of the system is minus the energy lost at infinity. And the exercise of landau lifshitz is to make you compute this. Ah, sorry, I touched something, no. To, to make you compute this, and conclude that the effect is so small that you, nobody cares. But uh, Freeman, Dyson understood that this is true when the two objects are far apart. But from this equation, when you solve it, you find that the two objects get closer and closer. And then if you wait long enough, and if the two objects are compact enough, like two neutron stars or two black holes, after hundreds million of years, they will be very close. This is the distance as a function of time. And the gravitational waves they will emit will get very intense because now they go faster and then the gravitational wave emitted and the energy flux gets enormous. And Freeman in 1963 explicitly said that uh, there will be at the end an intense flash of gravitational waves emitted by the last orbits of unimaginable intensity. And he added it should be interesting to use detectors of the type developed by Joe Weber to see these events. So he was really the first one to understand that the most interesting part of this system is at the end, when the two bodies go fast and merge. And this is exactly all the events that we see today. Yes? Did they remove that sentence from the... Yes, they, in, the, in the new edition, I have checked this, yes, because I checked on my book. <laughs> but the edition, for instance, that Freeman Dyson had, had this sentence, okay? Uh, but starting in 1970, they changed, they removed the sentence, yes. Okay, let me again try to Yes. Huh? Okay, so now we enter in the meat of the subject. Uh, So we are talking about a binary system which for many, many years, hundreds of millions of years, is made of two compact objects that go around each other. What we have shown on the previous transparency is that when it goes really slowly, Einstein gave us formulas, which is um, what is the emitted gravitational wave, the emitted flux, and what is the, and Newton gave us the formula for what is the energy of a binary system, okay. But uh, these formulas are accurate only like, you know, many years back, okay. When, when the object starts moving faster, and actually at the end, when they get near, close to merger, the velocity of each object is half the velocity of light. And therefore, you need to include corrections in V over C square and V over C4, because in order to describe how the waveform evolves in time, you need a very accurate description of the loss of energy and also of the Hamiltonian, the interaction between the two. So during this long period where the two objects go around and get closer and closer, this is called the in-spiral phase. In the in-spiral phase, if you are not close to merger, you can use directly analytical calculations uh, uh, to describe them. But then, during the late in-spiral, during the last few orbits, they really go to, you know, one-third of the velocity of light, then one-half of the velocity of light. And then, 
these analytical formulas are not enough as they are, and I will uh, quickly describe that the first method which allowed to improve, but still an analytical method, is the method we invented with Alessandra Buonanno called effective one body, which in 2000 allowed us to compute this full curve, which was the first prediction of what is the gravitational wave signal emitted not only when the two bodies go around each other, but during the last orbit and at merger and after merger. And the reason we could do this is there existed works which date back from a, a key pioneering work by Vishveshvara in 1970. Uh, Vishveshvara, using formalism by uh, Regé, Wheeler, and then Zerilli, and then improved for spinning black holes, Tukolsky. It's a formalism of perturbing black holes. Uh, Vishveshvara was the first one to understand that when you have a black hole, and you perturb it by kicking it, by sending some waves, the response of these black holes contains characteristic vibrations, damped vibrations, which are now called quasi-normal modes, but these are like, you know, the ringing uh, vibrations, proper vibrations of a black hole, which are exponentially damped, and one can compute these modes, and the idea of this method was to say, okay, the end of the signal after merger will be a sum of these modes, and then you match it to what you can compute if you can go up to merger, and this gave this prediction, okay? This prediction was looked with, with suspicion by everybody in the world. The only people who believed in it were the people who, Alessandra and myself. But five years later, Franz Pretorius, made the first successful numerical relativity computation and, uh, and then confirmed this. I will describe this very quickly. So I, I want just to say that um, many different things came in the, in the prediction now which is used of these waveforms, you know. We will very uh, briefly say that uh, people had to describe uh, uh, an improved theory of the motion in general relativity of the two black holes, an improved theory of the gravitational waves emitted by systems, uh, something applicable to black holes, the theory of quasi-normal modes. Then, uh, with resummation methods, this gave the first estimate of the full waveform. Numerical relativity came in, but numerical relativity used many ideas that came from mathematical relativity that had been developed by mathematicians especially in France, Madame choquet in 1951 was the first one to prove mathematically the, So many things had to come together to, to give uh, predictions. Uh, now, among the methods that have been used from the analytical point of view to work uh, out the dynamics of two black holes and the gravitational wave emitted, there is the first uh, Age old approximation is called post Newtonian. It's called post Newtonian because it's an expansion in inverse velocity of light. And when the velocity of light is taken to be infinity and gravity propagates instantaneously, this is Newton's approximation. So at lowest order, you have Newton's 1 over r law, and then you have corrections which are called post Newtonian. There is another approximation which now has become uh, important again. And uh, people in this room, like uh, Vernizzi here, Filippo Vernizzi is uh, contributing to the worldwide effort to develop post Minkowskian approximation methods. Uh, then, I don't know if I will uh, describe it, uh, yes, very quickly. So anyway, there is a list of methods, and I just want at this stage, including numerical relativity, effective one body, and recently, new method came into the game. And I will barely touch, give a glimpse of this new method, but just to say that it's very beautiful conceptually to see that things, tools that have been developed in quantum field theory now become useful also for this ultra classical uh, problem of the motion of two very classical and massive uh, bodies. Now, very quickly, the problem of motion of two bodies has a long history in general relativity. The initial key idea, like everything in this field, <laughs> comes from Einstein. The, the beginning point of Einstein was to say, uh, if I have a test particle moving in some external uh, geometry, the, the gravitational motion uh, is described by a geodesic, which means a minimum length 
world line in the space-time curve G mu nu. Then Einstein also introduced the post-Minkowskian approximation, which means expansion in Newton's constant G. So at lowest order, you say the metric is Minkowski. Then uh, if you have masses around, you have a first order perturbation, a second order perturbation. And then for many years, people try to describe the motion of extended bodies by saying, okay, I will use the conservation of T mu nu and then describe the, the objects by a certain energy density. I will say a star is made of a fluid or whatever and describe this starting from the fluid equations. But this is a problem when you discuss the motion of black holes because a black hole does not contain any fluid, any matter, okay? Black holes is made of empty space. So how do you describe uh, the motion of two black holes. First, let me remind you of what is a black hole, in case you never heard of it. So, uh, the first solution that now we call black hole has been discovered two weeks after Einstein's wrote his equation at the end of 1915 by Carl Schwarzschild. And Schwarzschild found that this metric here, this space-time metric, is an exact solution of Einstein's equation. And at the time, he said this describes the gravitational field around the sun, a spheric symmetric gravitational field. It was, but this, this thing has peculiarities. You see, it contains in the denominator one minus two gm over c square r, which means that this coefficient here of dr square becomes infinite if the distance r from the center of your object gets smaller than two gm over r. So there was a solution and when you get too near the center of this solution, you find that a coefficient is infinite and the coefficient is zero. And it took 50 years for people to understand what it means, this zero, this infinity. Is it something physical? Is it just a mathematical artifact? Okay. The, the biggest understanding, the key understanding was due to Oppenheimer and his student Snyder in 1939. Then a rotating generalization of Schwarzschild called the Kerr solution was found. Then the Russian school with Doroshkevich, Zeldovich, Novikov was very important, and Roger Penrose, who got the Nobel Prize last year for the work he did in 1965. So our current understanding of black hole is the following. This is a space-time diagram. So time goes up and space is uh, two-dimensional uh, horizontal. And this structure here means that initially this disk here means that you have a star. And this star is on the verge of collapsing because it is too massive for it. So the self-gravity makes the star want to collapse. And, and this star collapses. This is what this line shows. This star goes to smaller size. In Newton theory, you would say the star goes back to a point at the center. But in general relativity, what happens is why the star goes to a very small radius. It deforms the space-time, and in space-time there exists this complicated structure, which is called a black hole. This part of the structure is uh, what is called the surface of the black hole or the horizon. The definition of a black hole is that there is a region in space-time around where the star collapsed, where light cannot escape. The light cones here are tangent to this thing, which means it is a region of space-time where gravity has become so strong that you cannot emit a light signal that goes out to infinity. So it's a definition for a black hole. But what is even more interesting is that inside, and more mysterious, inside the black hole, you have this thing which is black. And this is saying that what happens at the center of the black hole is that space-time disappears. Like in Einstein's theory, space is like a, a jelly, is an elastic structure. And this elastic structure is torn apart, and there exists no space, no time uh, above this thing. So inside the black hole, it's something very dramatic. That's why it took years to understand. Anyway, when you have two black holes, those complicated things, how can you, with pencil and paper, describe the motion of these two black holes? And this is done by a method called match asymptotic expansion, where you can still uh, decompose space-time in various regions and you can make approximation in each region. And then you can combine these. Uh, I will not describe this. Just to say that a practical way of doing the computation uh, uh, is called skeletonization, which consists in replacing the black holes, which are extended objects with this horizon, by point particles, formally, 
you say, no, no, I'd uh, seen from far away, a black hole is not a tube, it's just a word line. And on the word line, I put a delta function as if these were mass points. Uh, then you solve Einstein's equation formally. Uh, you can do this, as was done initially in the 80s by the post minkowskian method. Then you can compute the equations of motion of two black holes interacting via, so this diagram represents the interaction of two massive point particles, two black holes, with the linearized interaction, linearized gravity. Here you have non-linear effects of gravity, which take time, uh, which propagate with the velocity of light. Then the equations of motion were first computed to the uh, fifth order in 1 over C in, uh, in 1982. At the time, there existed no mathematica, so everything was done by hand on paper. It took uh, us some years to do it. Uh, then this was the result, and this contained, uh, so the equations of motion of two bodies contain the effect of radiation damping, that is to say the fact that gravity propagates at the velocity of light as an effect on the force acting on each body. This effect is here. And, uh, but at the time, these methods, so post minkowskian methods here, were already used in the 1980s. But then, after this, people said, if we want to go beyond, we need to compute more complicated quantities. These quantities are difficult integrals, and we did not know how to compute these integrals. So at the time, we said, OK, let's go back to another method, which is to make an expansion in 1 over C, because this makes these integrals simpler to compute. This is the post-Newtonian approximation. <laughs> Very quickly, the post-Newtonian approximation then was extended in many years. Today, uh, what is known fully is the uh, eighth order in V over C. At the eighth order in V over C, everything is known. It took years. It was first obtained in 2014. Uh, now, there are results at the next order, the tenth order. But at the 10th order, which is the frontier of the analytical calculations, there remain two rational numbers which are unknown. OK, there are problems with two rational numbers. I will not enter into the details. Let me just give you an impression. At the end of all this, you compute the interaction Hamiltonian of two bodies. And it is given by these formulas that I will flash here. At the lowest approximation, the Hamiltonian is given by this formula. And if you, have, if you look at it, p square over 2 m1, p1 square over 2 m1 plus p2 square over 2 m2 minus the g m1 m2 over r12. This is Newton's, OK? This is the Newtonian Hamiltonian, the kinetic energy of two bodies, and the interaction in 1 over r, OK? So this is known since 1687. The next order was first computed by Einstein in Feldman in 1938. The next order was actually first computed uh, by us in 1982. The next order was first computed by us in 2001. And the next order was, yes, also computed first completely by us in 2014. And you see, it gets really complicated. So it gets really complicated. And uh, the problem also is that this gets useless when it should be most useful because this is an expansion in V over C. You want you compute them to be able to describe the in-spiral. But when you go to the end of the in-spiral, each term of this expansion is comparable to the previous one, so you cannot use this till the end. So the same problem applies to the emission of gravitational waves. I said that to lowest order, the loss of energy to gravitational waves is given by the quadrupole formula of Einstein, which is simple. Okay. Now, this formula also was improved to higher order by a formalism called the multipolar post minkowskian formalism that we developed uh, essentially in France with Luc Blanchet, who is uh, around for a parallel conference, and Bala Ayer. Uh, and so this formalism has been very useful and was developed over many years. And um, this formalism solve, again, Einstein equation, but it solves Einstein equations now uh, outside of the system. You have two bodies that go around, like this in space-time. And then you want to solve with higher accuracy how they emit gravitational waves. So you solve this by combining, again, 
my matching two expansion, an expansion in the near zone and an expansion uh, in the external zone of the system. So you solve Einstein equations, multiple expand, you combine everything. Uh, you can relate the wave emitted at infinity to the source. So you get formulas that were developed over many years. The lowest order of these formulas is the quadrupole formula somewhere here. But you see you have many corrections to the quadrupole formula, including corrections that are integrals over the past. Let me pass over detail. At the end, the state of the art, and Luc Blanchet has been very uh, effective and, uh, in, in, uh, in pushing this formalism with his group up to high accuracy. The present state of the art is you can improve over the lowest order energy loss due to the quadrupole formula, which is this coefficient one here, to uh, v square over c square correction, v cube, v4, v5, up to v7 over c7. Okay. And the state of the art is that there is a problem now which is still incomplete at V8 over C8, which poses very delicate conceptual and technical problem. Oops, it moved by two things. At the end, at the end, as I said, one gets perturbation expansion for saying what is the Hamiltonian of interaction of two bodies and what is the loss of energy. So you can say, okay, we will do like Dyson, say, I will equate that the loss of energy of my system is equal to the flux of energy, each one being computed with higher accuracy. But then it was rightly pointed out by the group of Kip Thorne at the end of the 90s that uh, this method will not allow you to compute the last orbits for what I said, that the expansion gets bad uh, when they, they go to merger. And then they concluded Therefore, it's written here, there is an inability of current computational techniques to evolve the binary black hole uh, through its last 10 orbits. So what they said, uh, and this is what they were showing at the time, that you can use analytical calculations only up to here, and what happens during the last orbits, you cannot compute, and you need numerical relativity. Okay, except that numerical relativity did not exist and did not exist for five more years. So in Europe, we were more uh, daring and we said, no, we are going to propose a new method that bridges the gap and allows to compute the last orbit and add even the merger. This is the effective one body method. I will just give a few words of what is this effective one body method. Uh, it is made of several parts. Is the uh, representative? Yeah, the basic idea is uh, instead of having the full space time, which are two bodies going around, you are going to say in the center of mass of this binary system, if you want to describe the relative motion of the two bodies, which really comes from this deformed space time with two bodies, I will imagine that this is equivalent. Uh, to a test particle of mass mu, where mu is the usual Newtonian effective mass for, you know, Newton had shown that the two-body problem is equivalent to one-body problem for a particle of mass mu, m1, m2 over m1 plus m2, uh, attracted by the potential of the two-body system. So here you say, can we do something like that in general relativity, replace the complicated Hamiltonian I had shown, by a particle of mass mu moving in some relativistic space time that I don't know, but, and I need to construct this relativistic space time such that the equations, the geodesic motion of this is equivalent to, uh, did I have some useful information here? Uh, I already said that this was using, uh, the merger part was using result by Vishvejara. I should say that also, Davis, Rufino, and Tiomno uh, in Princeton in 1972 had found uh, something in a particular case. So, let me just show you how it works. This is the full Hamiltonian of two bodies at the um, third approximation in V square over C square. So, six order in V over C. So, it's a complicated thing. And this complicated thing when you use the effective one-body method, which say, I will replace this complicated thing by a particle moving in some external space-time, actually you show that it is equivalent 
to saying that I have a particle of mass mu coupled with some effective metric with an extra term which is quartic in momenta. And the effective metric that I need to put is given by this relatively simple formula. So you see this formula, this formula, and all these numbers here are equivalent to these complicated things on the previous transparency, if it wants to move back. Yes, this complicated formula is equivalent to these simple things, where here you have 1 minus u means gm over c square r. So this term for the coefficient, if you remember the Schwarzschild metric, the coefficient of dt square in the Einstein metric for Schwarzschild was 1 minus 2 gm over r. So it's this thing. So you see the new information is this coefficient, 2 nu, and this coefficient with pi square, 6 nu, this thing. So a very small number of information is extracted from the complicated thing. And motion in this thing is fully equivalent to the other thing. This needed to be uh, generalized to spinning bodies. I will not describe. There is a question. Yes, question? Uh, yes, I, I, I wanted to ask if this uh, met effective metric that you have, is it time independent? Yes, this, yeah, good question. So this effective metric here is time independent. And the reason, which I should have said, is here you describe the conservative part of the dynamics. The, I should have said maybe in a clearer manner that here we describe the motion of two bodies by separating, by neglecting in the first time the effect of radiation, uh, radiation reaction. The effect of radiation emission on the motion, the back action, is first neglected. It gives a conservative dynamics of two bodies. And this conservative dynamics is described by a spherically symmetric and time independent metric which is a deformation of the Schwarzschild metric for a test particle of mass mu moving. And then you add to it radiation reaction. And indeed, now radiation reaction, how is it added? It is added by a radiation reaction force, which says that the loss of angular momentum of my system, which otherwise would conserve angular momentum, is given by this formula. This formula is a sum over all multipoles of a gravitational wave emitted by the system. So you compute the gravitational wave by saying the two bodies move on an instantaneous orbit of my conservative dynamics. You compute the wave uh, at infinity by resumming all the perturbative expansion. So here there is a resummation, including an infinite number of logarithm, which is resummed in this formula, and gamma function resummation. So you have a resum version, so it improves the computation of the loss of energy. Then you put this as a radiation reaction force. And at the end, you have this thing. So exactly. So now we have the full EOB is doing this. You have equations of motion, which contains Hamilton's equation plus a radiation reaction force. The radiation reaction force is computed at each moment from the motion. What you see here is, uh, uh, is solving. And you can solve these ODEs simply you know, on a simple uh, PC. You solve this equation with radiation reaction. You compute the radiation emission. You put it back as a radiation reaction force. And you can compute this way. This is the way the EUB method works. You compute the waveform emitted by this motion of the two bodies. Okay? And, and this method has allowed to, to describe not only the in spiral, but also the last orbits and the merger, and at merger, you make an approximation saying when the two bodies, two black holes are very near, they fuse together to make a bigger black hole. And I describe the final thing by a vibrating black holes with a sum of QNM modes matched to the previous thing. OK. So it gives you an idea of the thing. Now, this was in 2000. In 2005, numerical relativity came in. Based on the mathematical work of many people starting in 1927, the French school has been very efficient, very useful in uh, understanding the mathematical structure of Einstein equations. But then it took 30 years for numerical relativity to work. For many years, people wrote codes. You know, initially they said, OK, we are good at numerics. We take Einstein equations. We put it on the computer. It will work. Then they were computing the motion of two black holes, and the, the black holes had barely moved that the code crashed. Okay? And codes crashed for many years. 
until people understood, and Pretorius was the first one to understand, that you need to combine some special ideas that come from mathematics, physics, uh, and up it worked. And this is the first result of Franz Pretorius. So it's the first computation, not very accurate, of the um, uh, waveform emitted during the merger of two black holes. And then in 2007 and then 2008, um, Alessandra Bonanno in the States and me in France with uh, Alessandro Nagar, uh, Luciano Rezzolla and others, as you see, there are many Italians uh, working in, the, in this work. Uh, we could compare the effective one body purely analytical waveform to numerical relativity. And even in the lowest approximation, you can see that the two things were uh, relatively good. The agreement was good. Then the agreement uh, was improved by, by using some information from numerical relativity. Then numerical relativity was allowing one to compute many waveforms. But still, although um, the numerical relativity groups could compute uh, the merger of two waveforms, each computation takes one month, two months, three months, you know, which is surprising. A physical event like the first thing observed, which lasts, you know, 0 0.2 seconds, it takes several weeks to compute on the computer, okay? Uh, but, but still, one can do it. And, but what is efficient is not to say, okay, we will use purely numerical activity because it's very slow, and also describe only the last orbits and the merger, is to combine everything. You say, okay, I will combine everything I know from analytics, from numerical activity, so there is a complementarity between analytical and numerical methods. And let me just exhibit one example of this complementarity. I said before, like for instance, the effective metric describing two black holes in the effective one body is described by an explicit formula, which is given here at the fifth order in G, okay? Uh, because there is a U6, so this is Newton. I mean, it's even the sixth order. So this is Newton. This is the 5 pn approximation, so it's sixth order in G. The logarithm is computed, but this number is not computed analytically today. But what you can do is you say, there is a number that I cannot compute analytically. It's too complicated. But what I can do is to replace this number by a number, a uh, function of the mass ratio nu. And then I will uh, fit this after resumming by Padé resummation this thing to numerical relativity. And I will use numerical relativity data to get a good value. If I find a good number from numerical relativity, tuned to numerical relativity that describes very well the waveform, then I have improved my analytical knowledge by using numerical relativity information. This is what is done, okay? It's done at several levels. At the end, you compute waveforms that combine uh, analytical effective one body information and numerical information for the merger. And on this picture, you have two waveforms. There is a waveform which is black, and you can see, yes, I have to say here, you can see here that the black thing is slightly different just uh, near merger, just after merger. But apart from this, it is exactly coincident with the analytical thing, okay? So it is the way you combine the two things. And then the analytical thing is an excellent representation of the numerical relativity result. And this is what is used to construct banks of hundreds of thousands of templates. So just to finish in the last 10 minutes, I want just to give a glimpse so this is the traditional methods which are still used today and which uh, allows an efficient complementarity between analytical knowledge and numerical information. But yes? Uh, does, does the agreement uh, persist or is it similar for different mass ratios? Uh, in the, you are right. This is a, a very important thing. One needs to do this agreement uh, um, for all mass ratios, uh, actually, the effective one-body method uh, has been um, has, has injected information to be good when the mass ratio is small. So for the effective one-body, the small mass ratio is good. And it's difficult to have numerical relativity data for the smaller SL. But the idea is indeed to check 
that you, you, you can do something which is valid for all mass ratio, from equal mass ratio to very small mass ratio, and for all spins, because here I have not described the complication due to spins. And when the spins are near maximum, when you take two black holes that spin near the maximum, and uh, here in first approximation you say, let's take them parallel, but then they will precess, you need to check the agreement and this is where the effective one-body method is very useful because you can describe processing spin, so you can compute things. You can, as I've showed here, add some parameters beyond what you know analytically, tune them to numerical relativity results. So you use a small number of numerical relativity results. You, you calibrate your analytical thing on this small number. Then you check on other simulations that you have not used in the calibration that this is still true for other things, you know, and then you say probably it's good all over the, all the parameters. Okay, this is the way it is done. Now, just a glimpse over the, the recent analytical methods, which go by several names. Effective field theory, you have heard of the general idea of effective field theory from Filippo Vernizzi. Tutti frutti, which is... Uh, <laughs> something that uh, developed with Italians, so we put an Italian, which was chosen actually by, a, by an American colleague. We did not want to give it a name, but then he called it Tutti Frutti because I used this. Uh, and uh, classical and quantum scattering. So, very quickly, um, the EFT approach, as you know, which was introduced in the field by Goldberger and Rothstein, uh, consists when you have a physical system of separating the physics by different scales, okay? Uh, if you have, for instance, two extended objects, in principle, you should describe the physics down to the scales inside the size of the object, then the scales, which is the distance between the two objects, then you have another scale when they move, which is the wavelength. If they move slowly, the wavelength is much bigger than the size of the system. But then in EFT, there is uh, although part of this way of saying I will replace the objects by point particles when I look at a distance was already used, it's the skeletonized description, so it's not the new part. The part where you also say when I look at what happens between the two things at the distance between the two was also used, but the new part is really the way to match what happens at the wavelength and the closed system where there is there are conceptual and technical differences between the EFT approach. I will not describe um, the things, but uh, from the practical point of view, what has been very useful is these methods could be combined with existing quantum field theory methods and codes, which allowed to put Einstein's equations expanded uh, in perturbation theory fully on the computer, compute everything uh, thing and uh, Johannes Blumlein and collaborators has allowed to compute things to the 5 pn uh, 10th order in V over C this way. Another method we introduced with Donato Bini and Andrea Geralico is called the Tutti Frutti. It's called Tutti Frutti. Actually, it's called Tutti Frutti because in France, when I was a kid, there was a, a game, a card game. Uh, where you had many rules, and at some point you say you put together all the rules, and this was called the tutti frutti part of the game, where you combine things from many different things. So the tutti frutti approach uh, is a way to combine information from post-Newtonian, multipolar post-Minkowskian cell force, I mean things that I did not describe in detail, but one combines information, different kind of computations, and at the end we could compute the full Hamiltonian at the 5 pn and 6 pn, so beyond what has been fully computed, modulo uh, a small number of coefficients, numerical coefficients, that we could not compute. So this was efficient because you could compute many things. Like among 100 coefficients, you computed 98 coefficients analytically, and there were two coefficients. You say, okay, we don't know these coefficients. Other people will give numbers. And, and actually what is surprising is the two missing coefficients are still not computed today. There are two unknowns which are rational uh, numbers. But the pi square terms have been computed by Johannes Brunner. And last but not least, over um, the last years, 
the use of purely quantum field theory scattering of two objects in, uh, interacting under gravity has been used as a new tool to learn things about uh, scattering. Actually, this idea, again, I see there are so many Italians, no? Corinal Desi in 56 was the first one uh, to say, uh, actually it was wrong what he said, but he said, uh, Einstein and Feldhoffmann in 1938 could compute the, the, the first post-Newtonian uh, interaction of two particles interacting by gravity, which means V square over C square correction beyond Newton. And he said, I will reproduce this by a quantum scattering calculation at the one graviton exchange, <laughs> which was wrong because you cannot do that at the one graviton exchange, but it, it was the idea that you can use quantum scattering techniques to learn something about the potential of interaction of two bodies. Then the Japanese group really did this at 1 p.m. fully correctly by uh, using Feynman diagrams. Then a very important thing with Daniele Amati from CISA, no? Yes. Uh, Marcello Ciaffaloni and Gabriele Venediano, uh, they were the first ones to get information at the two-loop level, uh, which means, you know, higher level of interaction, and in the ultra-energy thing. Uh, and then um, what was uh, understood, uh, yes, what was understood is that in the meantime, yes, there are very beautiful properties of gravity, classical gravity, that have been understood from string theory initially. So, you know, uh, string theory, initially invented by uh, Gabriele Veneziano and then Sergio Fubini and then many others, uh, uh, describes, okay, in string theory, you say that the fundamental particles are not point particles but are excitation of small strings. And the graviton, which usually is thought in Einstein theory, it's a gravitational wave. In quantum field theory, it is a massless particle. The graviton is actually the lowest mode of a closed string, okay, which oscillates. And because of this, in string theory, you find that the interaction of uh, gravity is described by the square of uh, Maxwell or the square of Young Mills. Technically, the H mu nu, which has two indices, is like the tensor product of two vectors with one index, okay? And this idea that Einstein even toyed with is uh, technically embedded in string theory. And then in QFT, Zwiebern and others understood, I mean, KLT, huh? there is a long story, which allows to describe the complicated quantum interactions via gravity by the simpler interaction that you have in QCD. And, and then there are many uh, integration techniques because it's not enough to compute the integral, integrand, you need to compute integrals. So many beautiful techniques have been used. I should say that what we are talking about is the scattering of two particles. You can also write the scattering of two particles classically. The difference between scattering and bound states is scattering, you have two particles coming in and they come out at some angle and they don't go around like this. So, uh, and the group of uh, Rafael Porto has been efficient in pushing results in the post minkowskian approximations. But the, the, the breakthrough results have been obtained by Zvi Bern uh, and his group in California. He was the, he was the first one to compute the two loop uh, interaction uh, and uh, by using uh, quantum field theory techniques. And then recently he pushed this to the three loop level, uh, first taking into account uh, neglecting uh, radiative effects in the system, recently taking into account an effect we had first understood in 1988 with Luc Blanchet, which is conceptually interesting, which is when you have two bodies going around, when you have a binary system, there is an interaction between the two bodies which is mediated by a gravitational wave which has been emitted millions of years ago, which came out of the system, which backscattered on the curvature of space-time, and then 
went back to the system to create a correlation between the dynamics here millions of years in the past and the dynamics now, which is given by an integral, uh, which appears, I, I had written somewhere in the previous thing. This thing now appear in quantum field theory. And actually, there are new subtle effects linked to these radiative effects that some of these radiative effects are conservative-like and some are radiation reaction-like. And this is a frontier problem because one still does not know the answer at the interesting level where all radiative effects, so it's a frontier problem. The conclusion is that analytical approaches in the past have been very useful, are still useful today, and will be useful in the future and will need to be improved because the detectors, there will be an O4 observing session. I mean, LIGO, Virgo uh, will start again. Now they are stopped, okay? But they will start again next spring with improved sensitivity. And each time you improve the sensitivity, you want that your computation of the templates follows this improvement to be sure that you don't lose accuracy when you extract things. So it is important for future gravitational wave detectors that will also include future generations that will be really much more accurate to have uh, improved uh, templates. And this is why the current effort to mix several methods is useful. And uh, from, on a personal note, I, I concur with what Henri Poincaré uh, said and probably Henri Poincaré was talking, you know, about the end body problem because Henri Poincaré had worked for 20 years on the celestial mechanics. And then first he thought he had understood things. He got even one of the biggest prize at the time with uh, big money to do this. Then he sent the text of the paper for which he got the prize and somebody who was editing the thing said, but. On page 30, <laughs> I see there is a gap. Professor Poincaré, could you explain what you are saying there? Because it does not look clear to me. And then Poincaré realized he had made a big mistake. And, but his big mistake was very efficient because then he understood chaos. He understood he had missed chaos. And then he understood he had to redo everything. Uh, he had to pay all the things that had been already published and that exhausted all the prize he got. But anyway, this, uh, so Poincaré had understood that when there are uh, important problems of physics, these important problems, like the n-body problem in celestial mechanics and the two-body problem in general relativity, those problems are never fully solved, you know. They are more or less solved, but there are always layers of understanding, new understanding, and today, there are new layers of understanding of analytical methods of the two-body problem in general relativity. Okay, thank you for your attention. Thanks, Thibault, for the very interesting talk. So now we have time for some questions. Don't be afraid, there are no stupid questions or uninteresting questions. So let me ask you a question. Uh, so these methods, uh, you, the scattering methods that you mentioned, um, is there a hope that also they can go all the way to the, to the merger points or should I think of them as methods that are only useful in the earlier phases of Inspire? They are, they can definitely, actually there is, um, in my view, uh, because it is an expansion um, in, uh, in G and uh, which keeps all powers of, of V over C, uh, the result as they get them are uh, directly useful during the Inspire all although they are not yet competing with what the post-Newtonian are, are giving, uh, actually, like the 6pn thing uh, uh, would be seventh order in G, which is far what can be computed from this method. But they are complementary. They, they give us a, a lot of uh, new understanding of some resummations in V over C. 
And in my view also, once you improve anything during the in-spiral, if you convert it in EOB language, because what I've not shown is, which I will describe in my talk tomorrow for the Iraq uh, medal ceremony, is uh, effect, the effective one body is not only a way to compute templates, but it is a formalism which can combine information from various things, and in particular, the scattering uh, data can be directly transformed in effective one-body Hamiltonian, which can then be used up to merger by using EUB type ideas. So it's not directly giving what you want, but combined with other things, it's very useful, I think. So there is a, um, a question from uh, on uh, can these analytical methods uh, be used uh, in modified uh, theories of gravity? Yes, uh, but one has to redo things. There, for instance, the effective one-body method has been extended when there is a scalar interaction, okay? And in principle, uh, depending on the thing, it can be extended indeed to any modified gravity approach. And a second question is, uh, when first comparing uh, one body effective approach uh, and numerical GR, which one was considered the trustful result to compare the other one with? Good question. <laughs> so let's look. <laughs> let's look at the figures, okay? Okay, so uh, for instance, yes, in, because there is information here. The black curve is the original 2005 result of Franz Pretorius. And as you see here, the black curve is oscillating here. So actually, at the time, it was concluded by the authors that in this region, effective one body is better, that the real curve is, is this thing, okay? But probably uh, in this region, which the merger is here, and this is the post-merger, the idea was here, Okay, here we understand the physics which is computed in numerical relativity is more accurate, so the real curve should not be DOB1 and things like that. So at the time, you know, there was already a complementarity, and soon when the data became more accurate, one could understand that indeed in EOB, for instance, you are including this and this, but not the next order, so you could include the next order and tune it, and then the agreement was 99%, so you said, okay, both of them are, are good. But it's true that there was never a proof that, I mean, yeah. yes. <laughs> when there were several numerical simulations, yes. On the previous thing, for instance, you see uh, Pretorius got this. Then other people could reproduce the thing of Pretorius to some accuracy. Then there was confidence that to some accuracy numerical relativity was okay. Yes? Uh, sorry. I'm confused. Uh, you, you've mentioned that uh, it, uh, the matter is uh, collected at one point in black hole and... It's not really, yes. So, two things. A black hole is a region of space-time. If you go close to a black hole and you have the surface of black hole, you see, there is no matter there. If you fall in a black hole, you fall in, from the classical point of view, there is no matter at all. I don't trust firewalls and things like that, okay? And uh, when inside, you are not going to see a point mass at the center. What you see in a black hole classically is space-time disappears a millisecond after you fall in, okay? But if you look at a black hole from a distance and you say it is like looking at the sun at a distance, you say, if I'm far away, the sun, you don't see, uh, not here, but <laughs> the sun will look like a point, and what is more important is the gravitational field that's uh, generated by the sun will be one over R, you know? It's a theorem, actually, of Newton that a spherically, spherically symmetric object creates a one over R field. If the object is not spherically symmetric but deformed, there will be non-spherically symmetric things, but when you go far away, they become negligible. So it is in that sense, that in EFT sense, that if you are far away from the size of the object, you can replace the object, even if it is not a point particle, by a point particle. Okay. For so, some descriptions. 
Yeah, I got your point. And, uh, and then it's very efficient technically to solve the equation. Yeah. So is it sufficient to collect uh, the matter in a radius less than Schwarzschild radius to form a black hole? Yes, yes. Uh, for spherical symmetry, it's clear. There, there are conjectures if it's not spherically symmetric exactly in what um, radius you need to collect the matter, but let's say it's clear that if you succeed in collecting the matter within something like the Schwarzschild radius, the thing actually will collapse fully and create a black hole. Thank you. Uh, hello. Uh, am I audible? There? Yes. Yes. Hello. Uh, okay, I have two questions. Uh, first question is when gra actually we are talking about the gravitational waves that are actually we are detecting are from two black holes, they are merging together. So they are actually traveling well, very far. So can you please tell uh, what if these gravitational waves will interact with another waves that are actually present in space, for example, electromagnetic waves are there? Sorry, can you repeat the end of the question about the electromagnetic waves? I just want to ask that gravitational waves travels very long to be detected by us on the Earth. I just wanted to ask their interaction with the another waves uh, present in the universe. For example, electromagnetic waves ah, are there. Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, good question. First, in in Einstein's theory, and it has been uh, verified experimentally by LIGO Virgo. Gravitational waves propagate at exactly at the same speed as electromagnetic waves. So it's just one fact. Now, if you have an electromagnetic waves which comes from some direction and which passes uh, within a gravitational waves, for instance, if you have a source of gravitational waves and if you have electromagnetic waves that pass near a gravitational wave source, you might think that this will make an effect on the electromagnetic waves, that if you see uh, a far away object in electromagnetic waves and these waves have passed through a gravitational waves, there will be oscillations. Actually, the answer is no. Uh, apart from memory effects, uh, when you pass through a gravitational wave, at the end, the electromagnetic waves are not uh, uh, distorted, okay? Uh, now, what happens also is when you, you have an electromagnetic wave, another answer to your question is that if you have, for instance, a, a charged black hole, so a region where there is an electromagnetic field, static electromagnetic field, if you have a gravitational wave which passes here, it will be, because it has the same velocity as electromagnetic wave, it will be converted in electromagnetic waves. There will be an oscillation that the gravitational waves will become a little bit electromagnetic waves, and at the end, if the distance is large enough, it can be fully converted in electromagnetic waves, or reciprocally, that a gravitational wave passing in a region with strong electric fields can be converted in electromagnetic waves. Yes, so this is indeed maybe what you had in mind, conversion between, but these are usually negligible. We have no example. This is how do we know that the de detection we are getting is of gravitational waves only because it might be a interaction with the EM waves also. Interaction with, sorry, what waves? Uh, I'm saying that you just told that gravitational waves because of their same speed, they can be converted into the yes. EM waves. Uh, so how do we know that the waves we are detecting are the gravitational waves only? Because still there is a, a mention of gravitons, but still not detectable. And you also said in the quant quantum scattering method also. So can you please let it a little bit? I mean, I have just this question, basically. Okay, first, when I said there is a conversion, this conversion depends on uh, the intensity of the electro electric fields, okay? You need very strong electric fields for instance, near a maximally charged black holes to have this conversion. With the usual electromagnetic fields, magnetic fields that exist in the universe, I think that these conversion effects are negligible. What is not negligible is the fact that gravitational waves uh, uh, see, like electromagnetic waves, the fact that the, the geometry of space-time is complicated and you have microlensing, okay? So, 
uh, gravitational waves are deflected by uh, gravitational potential, and you, you could have in principle, so maybe your question could be that, uh, one could see gravitational waves emitted from extremely far that should not be detectable if the gravitational waves has been uh, lens, okay? But for the moment, there is no, yeah, is there really a proof, okay? One is computing the distance which for the first event is about one billion light years. So what is the absolute proof that this has been emitted directly from the system? Okay, the proof is that the computation, which is this direct computation, agrees to 97% with what you see. So uh, this is the only proof that this is a wave primarily emitted by the binary system and not some conversion. But, but you're right that it's useful to think about possible other effects. Okay, thank you, sir. And sir, can you please explain a little about quantum scattering analytical method that uh, actually was in the last slides? Uh, what is this quantum scattering thing? So the quantum scattering computes, you know, the quantum amplitude, you have two particles that come in with momenta P1 and P2, and you compute the, the quantum amplitude, which is a complex number, which is a function of what is the square root of the probability that they are deflected in some new momenta p prime one and p prime two. So you compute uh, this quantum amplitude by Feynman diagram. Actually, there is the subtlety that you are interested in the classical limit. In the classical limit, you cannot use Feynman diagrams. You have to use an infinite number in principle of Feynman diagram and show that they are resum like uh, in WKB approximation by an exponential of I times the action divided by H bar. So you need to show this, and this has been shown to some accuracy, in particular by the group of Paolo Di Vecchia, Gabriele Veneziano, Rodolfo Russo, Carlo Eisenberg. Uh, and uh, then from a perturbative computation, you get essentially what is the WKB effective uh, action, radial action, uh, that you would have in the, in the classical scattering of two bodies. So you use a quantum computation, an amplitude, and you extract from it information about the WKB econal approximation phase, okay? I'm sorry, yeah, sorry, it's a complicated thing that I try to describe in a few words. Okay, thank you, sir, thank you. Sir. Uh, I would like to ask uh, two basic questions, uh, if I'm not interrupting anyone uh, on Zoom. Uh, so as you emphasized, uh, we are solving uh, vacuum Einstein's equations. Yes. Uh, and uh, you've mentioned that in cosmology, we are working with matter matters in cosmology. Mm -hmm. So, but let's say that uh, it doesn't matter that much, but still we know that the space is expanding mm -hmm. so how is so in so what i understood from this that uh we basically solve in some uh solve some uh, vacuum Einstein's equations do some expansions in terms of some parameters but then how could these be combined with the expansion because they're since space expands on large scales but gravitational waves are yes. small ripples Yes. in space itself, so how is this combined then? Yes, it's a good question indeed. So basically what I have described is if you think of the emission of the, for instance, the first source, which was a billion light years away, it's the computation which uh, is valid uh, there. So if you, if you go back in time yeah. and you are around this system, far but not too far, not at cosmological distances, yeah. It describes these waves, okay? Mm -hmm. Then you need to say, ah, these waves, now I will describe them in the econal approximation, which means also, um, you know, the uh, geometrical optics approximation. And then you need to trace how these waves propagate uh, in the cosmological space-time. Mm -hmm. For instance, the polarization uh, tensor is parallelly propagated in space-time. So you, you can take into account cosmological effects fully, mm -hmm. uh, including in principle microlensing and, and things mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. The most important effect is that the distance one over R, which appears there, 
you, you, you prove that this is, so it's the what, luminosity distance. I mean, you have to connect uh, this to cosmological distances, okay? What is the distance you measure? Mm -hmm. And also, when you use these formulas, because those templates, they are computed in terms of masses, M1 and M2, which are the masses as they would appear uh, locally, right. okay? Right. If you measured in kilograms then. When you use these templates here, after the cosmological uh, uh, transportation of this thing, you prove that the masses you measure by using these templates are not the real masses, but redshifted masses by one plus Z, okay? Mm -hmm. So you need to correct this, that you say, what you measure, you know, are not the real masses, they are redshifted masses. And if you know the Z, the redshift of your source, then you can know what are the real masses, okay? Mm -hmm. So indeed, you combine the two things approximately, and, and it seems to be sufficient for. Right, right, right. So there are two infinities in principle, like one infinity yes. where I define the masses and then yes. cosmological yes. hour infinity. The local infinity yeah, yeah. In, <laughs> in a local rest frame far but not too far from the system and then here. Mm -hmm. And my second question, if I can, uh, uh, so what, what, what do you think would be uh, the future role of maybe some exact solutions because, because there are already many since the Einstein-Rosen cylindrical waves through like Penrose description of null infinity and so on, how, how these methods could be, could be maybe uh, used in future for maybe numerical relativity and so on. Here you mean exact uh, solutions for gravitational waves? Yes, yes, for gravitational waves. Uh, um, there are very few, uh, as you know, I mean, um, exact solutions for gravitational waves always have very special symmetries, and yeah. um, they also sometimes are confusing. Like, for instance, you know, th there is a paper of Einstein of 1936 where he, he found one of the first exact solutions for gravitational waves, and then these waves had a singularity somewhere. That's why he wrote a paper with Rosen, so it's an Einstein-Rosen paper, uh, in which he said, do gravitational waves exist, question mark, because there was a singularity, then it was understood this singularity is a coordinate singularity and things like that. Now, when you allude to Penrose, there are two types of Penrose things. I mean, you can have two plane waves uh, scattering each other, or you have the Penrose description of waves at infinity, okay? Yeah. Which is coming back as an important tool because now there are many, uh, okay, so it is linked to the scattering problem. In the scattering problem, I want to describe something that comes from infinity in the past. Objects come from infinity in the past and go to infinity in the future. And there are many uh, interesting developments and uh, not so clear results about whether uh, the Penrose description and the, the, some of the symmetries of asymptotic gravitational waves are, are really correct, you know? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, um, like, for instance, I had shown in 1986 that when you take into account the scattering of two particles, actually it messes up the definition of what is an asymptotically flat uh, space-time. Mm -hmm. But now there are many works by uh, Andy Strobiger, and there is a parallel workshop. Uh, maybe you are part of this. There exist uh, now people in the old CISA building are discussing these issues. So there is an interesting debate now, whether mathematical definition of what happens at infinity is directly relevant for uh, gravitational wave computation, or one needs to take into account subtle effects linked to tails, linked to these correlations of uh, infinite times that I was mentioning, mm -hmm. which really creates problems. Right, right. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So may I go next? Uh, so the... There has been many questions and we are a bit behind, so let us save yes. the other questions for later. And thank the Baltic. Okay.